Hi, welcome back. Last week I valued Tesla. And when I valued Tesla, I said, this is a company on which I'm going to get pushback. So no surprise, I did get pushback from both sides of the divide. On the one side were the Tesla bulls, and they felt that I'd underestimated the company's potential, both in terms of revenues and profitability, and come up with too low value. And the other side, there were a few who felt that, you know, I've Clearly, still I'm overestimating revenues. This company is really not worth what the market thinks it is. Now, I'm not defensive. I really can take punishment. I can take debate from both sides. But there were aspects of dissent and debate where I thought it would be useful to revisit my post because some of the, some of the critiques seem to be reading my valuation wrong and some of it just seemed to be about valuation first principles. So I thought it would be worth going back to the valuation, filling in a few details, and then talking about the kinds of critiques I've heard and why I'm going to stay with my valuation. So let's start with my original valuation. This is a you know, repetition of what you saw last week, but I've added a column. I've added a column for the revenue growth rate each year. The reason I wanted to flesh out the column is so that you can see the growth rate each year as I get from 100, no, 81 billion in revenues in my trailing 12 months to about 430 billion in revenues by the time I get to the terminal year. Now the reason I wanted to go back to the valuation is here are the details I wanted to focus on. If you notice the revenue growth rate I'm using for the next five years is 24%. For those of you who've been following my Tesla valuations over time in November of 2021, the revenue growth rate I used for Tesla was 35%. That seems like quite a climb down, right? From 35% to 24%. Now, I think revenue growth rates can be incredibly deceptive when the scale of the company is changing. And to show you why the 35% and 24% growth rates are not that different from each other, if you go back and visit my November 2021 valuation, the one with the 35% growth rate, and you look at my revenues in 2032, which is your, the terminal year in that calculation, I come up with about $420 billion. Well, in this valuation with a much lower growth rate, guess what my revenues look like in 2032? About $412 billion. In other words, it's the end game that matters, not the growth rate. Something to keep in mind when you see <clears throat> analysts debate or argue about revenue growth rates in year one, year five, it's really the end revenues that we should be talking about. That is my first point. The second point is a point about detail. There were quite a few people who saw this picture and saw my growth rate go from 24% to 3.47% and assumed that that drop happened in year six. In other words, I went from 24% to 3.47%. That is not true. That's not what I assumed. In fact, my growth rate continues to be higher than 3.47% in your 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. All I do is use your 6 through 10 to transition from a 24% growth rate to a 3.47% growth rate. Now, the 3.47% looks oddly precise. I'll come back and fill in the details on that. On the margins themselves, it is true that it looks like I'm downbeat on margins. The margins, the most recent 12 months, were 18.41%, and I seem to be bringing it down to 16%. The margin you see of 18.41% was over 2022, the entire year. And if you look quarter by quarter in 2022, it's a wildly volatile number. In fact, in the last quarter of 2022, the margins were closer to 16% as price cuts and cost pressures built up. I am telling a story that what you saw in the last quarter of 2022 is more likely to be what Tesla will see in the future. And that I'm willing, I mean, I think we can disagree on. So if you used an 18% margin or even a 20% margin, I think you can make a reasonable case. I just believe that it's going to move towards 16%. Now, the final point is about the cost of capital, the 10.15%. Now, if you notice, my original cost of capital, my November 2021 valuation was about 6%. You say, what happened? Well, the market happened. Risk-free rates went up, risk premiums went up. And there's really not that much room to actually play with the cost of capital. What I mean by that is if you compute the cost of capital for every U.S. company, as I have, and every global company, you know, 50% of companies have cost of capital between 8 and 11%. That's not a whole lot of room to run. So we're not talking about using a 10.15 instead of a 5% cost of capital. We're talking about a range that's pretty low. One final point about your 10 and the terminal year. 
I think this is one of the sources of confusion about discounted cash flow valuations in general. When you see a growth rate beyond year 10, this has less to do with your company and more to do with the economy. Let me explain. At some point in time, as your company scales up, it'll hit a wall. Every company does it. When it hits that wall, what happens is a company's growth rate will start to converge on the growth rate of the economy. It's a math issue. This is not a finance problem. It's as you get larger, it gets, you get to a point where you can't grow faster than the economy. That's when we put closure and valuation. In, the, in my case, I'm assuming that'll happen around $400 billion for Tesla. That's actually a pretty high number because uh, for it's true, for Walmart it happened around 450 billion, but for many companies you hit the wall around 50 billion or 100 billion. I'll come back and try to justify the 400 billion, but I'm assuming that Tesla hits the wall at 400 billion. Since it happens in year 10, I put them into the growth rate of the economy. And I use a proxy that I use repeatedly in valuation, which is the risk-free rate as my best estimate for the nominal growth rate of the economy. You think, why don't you ask economists? Come on. We want nominal growth rate in the US economy after 2032. You're gonna ask a macroeconomist and get a meaningful answer? They have a tough enough time telling you what the nominal growth rate of the economy will be next quarter, forget about 10 years from now. I'll take my bets with the risk-free rate being a, being a pretty decent proxy. We'll come back and address the specifics you might have about what if I disagree with that assumption. But I wanted to fill you in on the details to basically kind of, you know, if you have any of the criticisms came from misunderstanding my valuation, I take responsibility for that. Maybe I didn't fill in the details well enough. So with that lead in, let's, let me talk a little bit about the pushback I've got from both the bull side and the bear side. In terms of the breakdown of dissent, it was about 75% of the dissent came from the bulls who felt that I was coming up with too low a value. And that makes sense because I found the company to be overvalued, albeit slightly when I did my valuation. About 25% came in from the other side. We start with the first argument that I heard from Tesla bulls, which is they looked at my 400 billion in revenues and their reaction was only 400 billion? Not about you, but 400 billion is a lot of revenues. I mean, I believe that one of the things that, that you need when you think about companies is perspective. What do high revenues look like or low revenues look like? And nobody has that perspective naturally. You don't get it instinctively. It comes from looking at the numbers. So what I did was I took every publicly traded company in the face of the earth in tw at the end of 2022. I looked at their revenues in the last 12 months leading into 2023. So it's an annual revenue. And I look for companies with revenues exceeding 400 billion. You know how many companies there are in the world with revenues that exceed 400 billion? There are five. Two, one is a retail company, Walmart, the largest company in the world in terms of revenues. Amazon, semi-retail company, 500 billion. The other three are oil companies. And because oil prices were high, those revenues were high. If oil prices had dropped 20%, they'd have dropped off the list. Now, it's true that the revenues we're talking about for Tesla is in 2032. There's an inflation effect. So I said, let me look for companies with revenues above 300 billion. Well, the, number, the list gets longer, but it's only 10 companies. But here's the more interesting component of these companies. First, if you notice, five of these 10 companies are oil companies. They'll ebb and flow with oil prices. Um, there are, uh, you know, one, of course, is a retail company, Walmart, with um, revenue growth of 2.38% and margins of 4%. Slim grow, uh, no, low growth and slim margins. Amazon had high growth in the last 10 years, but low margins. What I'm trying to say is not only is it unusual to have a company with revenues of 400 billion, it's even more so to have a company with revenues of more than 400 billion with double digit margins. In fact, the only company on this list that meets that criteria is Aramco, right? And the only reason its margins are so high is not because it's some exceptional company, but because the oil under the Saudi Arabian sands is so cheap to extract that they make huge margins. So when I used a revenue growth rate of 400 billion, I was making Tesla already, not just a good company, but a great company. The second pushback was in a related point. You know, and was, why are you giving Tesla only 16% operating margins? Only 16%? 
I know it's a, you know you might believe that Tesla is a superior product, its customers are loyal, it has pricing power. I agree with all of those. But remember the driver of margins more than any of those factors is unit economics. Sounds like some buzzword, but unit economics looks at how much do you get when you sell that extra unit? What does it cost you to make that unit? The kinds of companies that have 30, 40, 50% margins that people want to throw around for Tesla are companies where it costs almost nothing to make that extra unit that you sell. Like Microsoft, a software company, the extra unit of software costs you close to nothing. Of course, you can have high margins. Aramco, the cost of oil in the Saudi sands is so low that almost all of the price is pure profit. With Tesla, even if you accept the, uh, the argument, it's a superb company, amazing product, to the extent that the bulk of its revenues come from cars, and we'll come back and talk about the other businesses, those cars have to be manufactured no matter how efficiently you make them. You're not going to operating margins of 30. In fact, they had a tough time delivering gross margins of 25%. The kinds of companies that, that deliver operating margins of 30 to 40% have gross margins of 70%. And as a manufacturing company, Tesla cannot have those. Of course, Tesla has a software business, you're saying. Their margins should be higher. True. But software is a high margin, low revenue business. It's not the kind of business that generates hundreds of billions of dollars in revenues, especially for a company like Tesla. Microsoft, the largest software company in the world, has 200 billion in revenues. And that is the largest software company. So even if you make an argument that Tesla has other businesses that have higher margins, those businesses on a revenue basis will not be 50, 60, 70% of Tesla. They're more likely to be 20%. So if you look at my 16% margin, it's true that I'm not inflating that margin, but I think it's going to be really difficult for Tesla to push that margin up substantially. As I said, I, you know, maybe 18%, maybe even 20%, but beyond that, you're pushing the limits of what Tesla can deliver. The third pushback I got was, why are you valuing Tesla as an automobile company? What makes you think I'm valuing it as an automobile company? In fact, if I valued it as an automobile company, there is no way, no chance that I could give them revenues of 400 billion. The largest automobile companies have revenues of 250, 280, 300 billion. Toyota, Volkswagen, those are mass market automobile companies. The very fact that I give Tesla revenues of 400 billion and a margin of 16% automobile company margins are single digit margins tells you that I'm assuming that Tesla is going to have a mix of businesses, software, energy, batteries. You're saying, why aren't you breaking those down? I'll tell you what my priors are on, on detail and valuation. I follow a very simple rule. Do not break items down into detail unless you have information you can bring in in forecasting that detail. In other words, if your company is going to be in five businesses, but you really have no way of knowing how those businesses are going to grow, what, what's going to happen within each one specifically, breaking things down into multiple businesses just for the sake of doing it, doing so, will give you the illusion of precision when in fact it makes your valuation less so. What I'm valuing here in Tesla is not an automobile company, but a company with multiple businesses, but I'm valuing them as a bundle because I really don't know how these other businesses will unfold, but I'm making an assumption that automobiles will remain the center of that business. You're welcome to disagree with that. Now, of course, I got a lot of pushback in autonomous driving and how it's going to be this huge business. I am still wrestling with what exactly the business part of the autonomous driving will be. Because I hear a lot of, you know, a lot of smoke in this process, but very little substance. So let's think about the different ways Tesla might be able to take advantage of autonomous driving. Let's start in the best case scenario that Tesla is way ahead of everybody else in autonomous driving. That's an assumption. Not everybody agrees with that. Let's suppose this autonomous driving business actually becomes a big chunk of driving on the road. Again, there's a lot of debate about whether that will happen three years, five years, 10 years, or 20 years, because it's not just a question of technology. As long as there are human beings driving cars, it's going to be very difficult for autonomous cars to take over the roadways. But within the autonomous driving business, 
you have to be specific about how you expect Tesla to make its money. Is it going to make the cars and sell them to the individuals who want autonomous cars, the ride-sharing companies? So maybe the Ubers of the world will do the ride-sharing part of autonomous driving and they will buy the cars from Tesla. In which case, it's going to show up as auto revenues. Maybe you believe that Tesla is itself going to be in the ride-sharing business. It's a little lucrative, right? Because you own the car, you keep 85% of the fare. The problem is it's a, it then becomes a capital intensive business. Does Tesla want to make cars that it no longer sells, that it now uses the basis for autonomous driving? You can't have your cake and eat it too. I think if you want to flesh out these other businesses and make them the center for Tesla, you've got to think about the consequences for the rest of the businesses Tesla is in. Finally, let me get to the terminal value. It's a lot of angst about terminal value. Why in your 10? Why 3.47%? As I said, this has nothing to do with Tesla the company, or less to do with Tesla the company, and more to do with scaling up, hitting a wall, and the growth rate of the economy. I am assuming that Tesla will hit that wall at 400 billion. And I'm assuming that will happen around year 10. And once that happens, there's nothing more to debate. I can't change the growth rate after that because this has nothing to do with the growth rate of Tesla. It's a growth rate in the economy. I'm using the 3.47%, the T-bond rate at the time, to be the growth rate in the economy. Of course, you might view this as too pessimistic. You might think that they will not hit the wall till they get to 600 or 800 billion, in which case you can either put a higher growth rate in the near term to push up revenues, or you can extend the growth period from 10 years to 15 or 20. But if you do that, just a note of caution, the median growth period for a high growth company in the US is between four to five years. 10 years is already at the 90th percentile. If you push that out to 25, you're at the 99th percentile. And that brings me to something that I think needs to be said. I know there are a lot of people, as I go through each of the assumptions, is probably saying, well, I'm okay with Tesla having revenues of 800 billion with margins of 20%, with growing for 20 years. In other words, you believe Tesla is an exceptional company. That's perfectly okay. It has done some exceptional things. But remember, exceptional companies are not always exceptional investments. In fact, this matrix is just simplistic. It should be common sense, but I put it out anyway. I've broken down companies from exceptional, broken, great, good, average, bad, abysmal. And I look at your assessment of the company, the market's assessment. So let's say you buy an exceptional company, but everybody else in the market also thinks it's exceptional. You know what? Your best case scenario is it stays exceptional, in which case you get fair value. Everything else is a negative surprise, right? If it's only a great company and you expect it exceptional, then you have to adjust your expectations down. The key to investing is to find mismatches. So don't make this a debate about is Tesla an exceptional company. Even if you believe that Tesla is an exceptional company, you then have to check the price to make sure that it's not being priced as an exceptional company. So if you were able to buy Tesla in 2019 or in December of 2022, you were, and and if you believe Tesla is an exceptional company, you are getting an incredible bargain. But if you bought Tesla when the market gap was 1.2 trillion, it was priced to be an exceptional company. Where's your upside? So rather than make this a debate about the company, you need to think about what's priced in because that's what's going to determine how good an investment Tesla is. Oh, one other thing about um, the exceptional nature of Tesla, one of the critiques I got that I can't get my hands around, that I'm not sure how to respond to, is that Tesla is such a special company and Musk is such an incredible visionary that you cannot capture its value with earnings and cash flows. What? You're an investor. What else are you going to get your value in? And if you're buying the stock, this is sophistry. When you buy a stock and you pay a price, guess what? You're building in an expectation that that specialness and vision is going to pay off in earnings and cash flows, but you're just doing it implicitly. All I'm asking you to do if you're doing a valuation is, hey, you believe the company's special and Musk's vision is amazing. It's your job, if you're an investor, to bring it into the cash flows. You can't hide behind, hey, it's too difficult to quantify because the minute you bought the stock, you've quantified it. Now, there weren't as many people pushing back on the bear side 
when I did this valuation, perhaps because they agreed with me in generic terms, but many, there were quite a few suggested that even $130 per share was way too optimistic. One of the first critiques that I heard was related to the near term. Coming into 2023, Tesla is coming off a wall of worries, right? It cut its prices. Its Shanghai plant is going through issues with COVID shutting it down. There are cost pressures building up around the company's supply chain. And of course, on top of this, you have worry about a recession in 2023. The question was, hey, I'm using a 24% growth in revenues in 2023 and eight, almost 18% margins. Maybe I'm whistling past the graveyard and ignoring these concerns. Not really. I mean, I, the reason I don't try to spend my time trying to quantify those effects in 2023 is it doesn't matter that much from a value perspective. Sounds like a weird thing to say. Let's say revenue growth turns out to be only 15% in 2023 because of a recession. It's a recession, right? So if there's a recession, there's going to be a bounce back and revenue growth is 33% in 2024. My overall value won't change at all. The reason I don't focus on near-term recessions is I'm not a macroeconomist. This is not where I want to spend my time focusing on, will there be a recession? How will it play out? If you're a long-term investor, you're buying a company through economic cycles, not for the next cycle. So if your concerns are about my 2023 numbers are wrong, you're, you're right, my 2023 numbers are wrong, but as long as my end game holds, doesn't matter that much. The second pushback I got, and this is the opposite of the pushback I got from the bulls, is that Tesla is an automobile company, that I'm giving it revenues and margins that no other automobile company has. In the views of Tesla bears, if there's other businesses, they're going to be bundled with the automobiles. Tesla software won't be sold alone. So in a sense, you're getting the opposite perspective of you should be adding to the revenues. Here it is, hey, you should be using lower revenues. On this one, I'm truly in the middle. I don't want to go the distance that Tesla bulls want me to go to and add hundreds of billions for autonomous driving or other businesses. I don't want to go to the bare limits and say there's nothing coming from the other businesses. Hey, you might not like my estimates, but I think I've kind of found my middle ground at least between these numbers. And finally, in the cost of capital, I heard from a few people that 10.15% is too low a cost of capital. Now, many of these people though, just make up stuff. They say a oh, good cost of capital is 15%. You can't just make up stuff just because you want it to be true. As I said, the range on a cost of capital for publicly traded companies in the US is between 8 and 11%. You know, 50 to 60% of companies fall there. There's not that much room to disagree on this one. So if your disagreement with me is on value, don't let the cost of capital be the reason. You can't come up with a cost of capital that's unsustainable in today's market environment. So here's the bottom line. I know you might, won't believe me on this claim, but I'm neither a Tesla bull nor am I a Tesla bear. I, it's true that I value the company probably a dozen times over the last decade. I found it overvalued more frequently than I found it undervalued. But it's also true I did buy Tesla in 2019. While I did hold it for only seven months, you can't put me in the I won't buy Tesla under any conditions camp. Clearly, I've been willing to buy Tesla. And if I done my valuation a little earlier, I probably have bought Tesla this month. So I am willing to buy Tesla, but perhaps I am not as upbeat as some people out there are about Tesla. If your account is, I'd have been far richer if I'd bought Tesla 10 years ago and just held on to it. You're right. Yeah, guilty as charged. I didn't do that. But you know what? If I'd done that, I would have had to abandon an investment philosophy that's worked reasonably well for me. And I wouldn't have passed the sleep test. To me, one of, the, one of the key indicators in whether you're investing the right way is, do you sleep at night? Do you think about your portfolio all the time? If you do, you fail the sleep test. I don't think I'd have slept as well as I did if I'd owned Tesla for the last 10 years. I'd be richer, but maybe I'd be on medication in the process. Now, for most of you, when you disagreed with me, you were, you were polite, and I, you know, I thank you for that. You know, this is, we can... I've said this before, and I will say it again. We can disagree without being disagreeable. That said, though, there were a few people who were clearly angry. There, You could see the vitriol come through as they responded, perhaps because the platforms were on, like Twitter, lend themselves to the 
300, you know, 340 character insult. Now, I, I am puzzled by the anger and the vitriol, to be quite honest, because I'm not an investment advisor. I value Tesla for one person and one person alone. That person is me. The one person whose decisions are driven by my Tesla valuation is me. I'm not trying to convince you if you don't agree with me to do things differently. In fact, I've designed my valuation for you to disagree with me. So if you're a Tesla bull, I'm not trying to talk you out of owning the stock and selling the stock. If you're a Tesla bear, I'm not trying to talk you into buying the stock if it drops below 130. It's your money. You have to make your decisions. In fact, the very fact that you find if your conviction that you know being shaken by my valuation tells me more about your conviction, whether it's really a conviction, than it does about my own valuation. If you're really secure in what you've invested in, what difference does it make to you that I agree with you or disagree with you? So I wish you the best and I thank you very much for listening.